So this video covers conjugate reactions and hard soft acid base theory as part of the second year organic and biological chemistry module. So if we're discussing carbonyl compounds, there's a common nomenclature which says that as you get further away from the carbonyl carbon, you can describe those positions with Greek letters. So we have the alpha position, which is immediately adjacent, and then the beta position, gamma, delta, and so on. One of the largest classes of compound which undergo conjugate additions are alpha, beta, and saturated carbonyl compounds. And these have a degree of unsaturation, or an alkene, in between the alpha and the beta positions, like this. So if we get rid of our Greek letters and we abbreviate our structure a little bit, this is broadly what we're looking at in terms of alpha, beta, and saturated carbonyls. And we can see that there is essentially a carbonyl component and there is an alkene component. Now in first year we discussed our alkenes in isolation and we did a range of reactions with different electrophiles. But at no stage could we really assign a delta positive, delta negative type dipole descriptors to an alkene because they're fundamentally unpolarized bonds. So it doesn't matter which of these you use, they're not really accurate. Uh, isolated alkenes are generally non-polarized. So if we want to react them with a nucleophile rather than an electrophile, that creates a problem because the nucleophile is going to push electron density into the alkene and the electron density from the breaking pi bond is going to have to go somewhere and usually that's going to be onto an isolated carbon atom which is going to generate some relatively uh, distasteful looking anions um, and it kind of doesn't matter which end of the alkene you attack you're going to end up with these rather ugly looking unstable anions. So isolated alkenes tend not to react with nucleophiles in this way. On the other hand if we're looking at carbonyls we know from the beginning of the second year module that carbonyls have a permanent dipole, so we can draw a definite delta positive, delta negative uh, descriptor on this bond. As such, when nucleophiles come in, they will attack the delta positive end and will kick the electrons up onto oxygen, which forms a tetrahedral intermediate where we have an anionic oxygen and the oxygen is reasonably happy to take that pair of electrons. So that's a viable reaction, and that's why carbonyls react with nucleophiles. So if we look at our uh, alpha, beta, and saturated carbonyl compounds all together, we've got a carbonyl component and we've got an alkene component. Now, because the carbonyl component has a permanent dipole, and actually we can go a step further than this and say that it has a resonance form, so if we push the electrons from the pi bond up onto oxygen to show the, uh, the, the most stable ionic resonance form, if you like, uh, because the uh, alkene over here is adjacent to this cationic portion of this resonance form, it's actually in conjugation with it. So uh, as we discussed in first year, you can use adjacent pi electron density to stabilize cations. So we can draw a resonance form where we push the electron density across here, and we end up with this resonance form, like this. So actually, the electron um, map of the carbonyl, if you like, is affecting the electron distribution in the alkene. And we have an electron deficient end of the alkene over here. So if we go back to our uh, non-ionic structure, we can say that we have a permanent dipole in the carbon-oxygen bond. And because of that, and because this alkene is in conjugation, we've then got a dipole in the alkene as well. So as a result, when a nucleophile comes into contact with an alpha, beta, and saturated carbonyl compound, it could attack the carbonyl carbon as normal, and we do one, two, substitution, addition chemistry, that sort of thing. Or it can attack the 1, 4 position, which is over here, the delta positive one. Um, we can push the electrons all the way through this conjugated system up onto oxygen, and that is conjugate attack. So 1, 2 reactions, as we've previously discussed in the module, proceed via a tetrahedral intermediate. So if we get direct attack from the nucleophile onto the carbonyl carbon, we kick the electrons up onto oxygen, we form a tetrahedral intermediate, and then the structure of this tetrahedral intermediate, the nature of the groups that are immediately attached to this carbon, dictates what happens next. Conjugate reactions, on the other hand, don't produce a tetrahedral intermediate. They produce something called an enolate. So if we push the electrons onto the 1,4 position, we kick the electrons across to form a new carbon-carbon bond, and then we push the electrons from the carbon-oxygen pi bond up onto oxygen, we form an intermediate like this. And this section over here is called an enolate. Now, enolates are nucleophilic, right? they are electron-rich, you have a negative charge on this oxygen, but we can draw a resonance form of this enolate where we push the electron density down and onto carbon. So here are the two resonance forms of an enolate. So enolates are nucleophilic at oxygen, but also nucleophilic at carbon. 
Now, we'll discuss uh, the useful reactions you can do with enolates later on in the module. But for now, it's, it's sufficient to understand that they are nucleophilic at this carbon atom down here. Now, this will persist until modified by the chemist. So we need to add a discrete second step. And we need something electrophilic to react with our enolates. So we add an electrophile. Now, again, later in the, in the module, we'll add a whole range of different electrophiles and we'll do lots of interesting reactions with enolates. For now, usually, uh, this electrophile is a source of protons, so an acid workup or something like that. So we attack through the carbon-based resonance form and we uh, att essentially attack our electrophilic uh, substrate and we attach our electrophilic portion to the alpha position of the molecule. So this is our 1,4 addition product, and we have effectively added a nucleophilic portion and an electrophilic portion across a carbon-carbon double bond, which is not possible on isolated carbon-carbon double bonds. So how do we predict which of these will occur? Because fundamentally, we've taken the same compound and we've treated it with a nucleophile, and in one case we have direct 1,2 attack, and in one case we have conjugate attack. So how do we know which is going to happen? So the answer to this uh, comes in hard soft acid base theory. So the idea behind hard soft acid base theory is that hard species, hard nucleophiles, will react preferentially with other hard species, hard electrophiles. So all of the hard species, which I've highlighted in purple, will react together. So hard nucleophiles, purple nucleophiles, will react with purple electrophiles. Similarly, soft species will react preferentially with other soft species. So all of the green soft nucleophiles will react with all of the green soft electrophiles. But what do we mean by hard and soft? Well, hard species tend to be small and have a high charge density. So you can think of reactions of hard species as being mainly ionic in nature, in that they're dominated by electrostatics. So hard nucleophiles tend to be highly electronegative or have a highly polarized, um, highest energy occupied molecular orbital. Um, this is often discussed in terms of polarizability, so you'll see them as being low polarizability. So hard nucleophiles, from, by, by example, things like hydroxide, alkoxide, and the small halides. So um, fluorine and chlorine are not very large ions, um, and they have a very small uh, volume in which to contain uh, a negative charge. Similarly, things like organometallics and grignards. Um, are hard nucleophiles because they are highly polarized, highly electronegative species. Conversely, hard electrophiles tend to be highly electropositive or have a highly polarized LUMO, lowest energy unoccupied molecular orbital. So we're looking at things like small uh, metal ions, lithium, sodium, potassium, or larger but high oxidation state metal ions. Um, similarly, things like hydronium, which are highly polarized. Soft species tend to be large and have a low charge density, so you can think of the, the soft end of the spectrum as being more covalent in nature, where the reactions are dominated by good orbital overlap rather than electrostatics. Soft nucleophiles tend to be less electronegative, so they're weakly polarized or non-polarized. Um, so we're looking now further down the periodic table, larger elements, sulfur compared to oxygen, phosphorus, um, the larger halides like iodine. Um, and in contrast to organolithiums and grignards, uh, and the, the sort of hard organometallic reagents, organocopper reagents tend to be softer nucleophiles and are used extensively in 1,4 um, conjugate addition chemistry. Soft electrophiles, similarly, less electropositive, weakly polarized or non-polarized. So we're looking at larger metal ions, which are in low oxidation states, elemental metals, um, and things like alkyl halides and so on. So as with anything, uh, it's a spectrum. It's not a clear, clear cut thing. Um, so I've just grouped all of these together as generally hard nucleophiles, generally soft nucleophiles, but there's always a borderline somewhere in between. So there we have things like uh, bromide. So compare with iodide and the, the other halides. Uh, amines tend to be pretty borderline. Um, and sort of the metal ions that are somewhere in between these two. So you can see it's a spectrum. It's not just a, a a clear-cut case of black and white hard soft. So if we go back to our uh, original structure of our alpha, beta and saturated carbonyl compound, we drew these dipole moments in, um, which we saw from the resonance forms and everything before. But if we look at really what's going on here, um, the carbon-oxygen double bonds, 
uh, the pi star antibonding orbital associated with that is heavily polarized because of the electronegativity of the oxygen. So if you like, we could increase the size and the beefiness of these uh, delta positive, delta negative signs to indicate that this is a highly polarized uh, bond. So as such, because it's highly polarized, this is the hard electrophilic site. And if we have a nucleophile, a hard nucleophile, it will prefer to attack the hard electrophilic site because that's the one that's more highly polarized. So things like organolithiums and Grignards tend to go for 1-2 reaction. If we look at our carbon-carbon uh, double bond, the pi star antibonding orbital of that is more weakly polarized because effectively the thing that's polarizing it is the electron sink uh, at oxygen and it's further away. So because the polarization is weaker, and we can express this by making these guys smaller, um, this then becomes the soft electrophilic site. And as a result, any nucleophiles which are soft, which are less polarized, um, more driven by orbital overlap, will tend to attack conjugate 1,4. So things like organocopper reagents um, and occasionally amines and that sort of thing will tend to go 1,4 rather than 1,2 because it matches soft to soft. 